I want to show you guys what I think is one of the greatest rock solos of all time. And it was played by a 23-year-old guitar player, and you will know exactly who he is once I start the song. But I also want to tell the story of the amazing way that this band got their record deal and quickly became one of the biggest bands in the world. So of course, that's Elliot Easton and the Cars and just what I needed. Now in a minute, I wanna talk about the solo and it has this interesting thing to it where you have to adapt to an A flat seven dominant seven chord. Even though the song and the solo are in the key of E and it's really a really cool thing to have to contend with. But before I do that, I wanna tell the story about how they got their record deal and it's an amazing story. Now. I learned this from interviews with Elliot. He's kind of become the historian and the spokesman for the band at this point, I would say. So the Cars were really big in Boston in the late 70s. And this was not Ben Orr's or Rick Ocasek's first band. They had been in du duos or bands together uh, for quite a few years. But this was their latest band, and Elliot was the youngest member of the band. So they were doing really well in Boston. And what happened was... A DJ at the local radio station named Max Ann Sartori, WBCN, the big radio station, started playing their demo tape in heavy rotation. Now, this is an unheard of thing. So what happened was there was a industry reporting magazine newspaper thing that would kind of show what was trending, what was exploding, what was blowing up all over the country called the Gavin Report. And this Gavin report would list the artist, the music, and the record label. Well, in this particular case, it listed the cars and the song, and instead of the record label, which would have been Columbia Records or Warner Brothers Records, it listed tape. Now, this magazine, newspaper, tip sheet, whatever you want to call it, was looked at by all the radio DJs and all the record company A&R people in the country. So when the A&R people saw that this band was blowing up in a major market, at a major radio station, in a major city, and saw that they didn't have a record deal, well, it generated a lot of interest. So the Cars ended up choosing between Arista Records and Elektra Records. They chose Elektra because it was more of a rock label. They also attracted Roy Thomas Baker as a producer. Now, Roy Thomas Baker had just done A Night at the Opera with Queen and Bohemian Rhapsody, amazing sounding record. So the Cars went to England to do this record and they got a big record deal and they got to record at George Martin's Air Studios. Uh, they were put up in a residence with a housekeeper and a cook uh, and they had a couple of fancy cars to drive to the studio and back in. They recorded this record in 12 days. Now, the reason they were able to do that, if you look at any videos from the band back then or any year, really, the cars were able to reproduce their records live perfectly. I mean, what I'm saying is the vocals were great. The background vocals were great. The instruments sounded great. They played great. Everything sounded thick and robust and like the record. So they had this record wired and they threw it down in the studio in 12 days. They mixed for nine days and then they came home. Now, Elliot, and you, you might actually understand this once you kind of acknowledge it, there's a little bit of a country flavor in a lot of his solos, I feel. And apparently his dad liked country music. So Elliot's influences were country rockabilly surf, of course the Beatles, of course Hendrix, and I want to show you a clip of Elliot kind of reenacting a solo in another song, uh, Shake It Up, I think. And it's at the Cars studio that they ended up putting together after they made it. They had their own studio. It's pretty cool. You can see the tape machine in the console. Anyway, he's playing this solo, and you can really hear the country influence, I think. Check it out. <laughs> Well, yeah. 
So when I say country, I'm really referring to his exquisite use of thirds in a lot of his solos. And this solo, and Just What I Needed, has a lot of thirds. And the way he adapts to this A-flat-7 is pretty brilliant. So the solo starts out... You know, we're in E. And he does thirds. And this pull-down is really specific. He drops, and then he comes back up. These things, when you try and learn a solo and you realize, oh, he's doing a lot more than I thought. It's really cool. And then... And that's him adapting to the A-flat-7. Okay, then we have sort of a George Harrison style. And then thirds again for the A chord. Stays there. Thirds over the E chord. And then heavy thirds on the next A flat dominant seven. And what happens next is a really cool country lick Travis picked, I'm sure. And he does it perfectly. One of the notes is so short, it just happens perfectly. It's actually easier for me to do it up here. But it sounds more correct the way he does it, of course. There we go. I got that short note that time. Uh, and then what might be called a Steve Cropper style run upwards. And he cuts it really short. So before we talk about the gear that they used, I just want to mention we are giving away a brand new collection of 30 free guitar lessons. And I feel like this could help you transform your guitar playing. It's absolutely free. So click the link below and you'll have instant access. So Elliot Easton did not bring a lot of gear to the recording session in London. I mean, the band had no money, so that was part of the reason. He brought a Les Paul and a Tele and a couple of pedals. Uh, apparently this solo was done with his red Les Paul that Elliot had refinished and an Ampeg V4 amp. And I can hear room sound on this solo sound. So I'm going to speculate there was a close mic and then a mic at the back of the room to get kind of the size. You can kind of hear it on the solo. Now, Roy Thomas Baker did chorusing the old-fashioned way. I guess Elliot had a chorus pedal, but the chorusing on the record was done by very speeding the tape machine. So what you would do, and I used to do this too. I did many, many years of analog recording many on two inch tape what you would do is you would do a track do your part pan it to one side and then on the other side panned hard over here you would record again but you would very speed the tape and you that meant you would just slow the speed down just a hair or speed it up just a hair to taste and it would give you the most exquisite chorusing effect when both would play back at the same time so he didn't use his pedals the other thing is that roy thomas baker would do delays with tape delay so that was the old-fashioned way also. Before we take some questions, I just want to show you the end of the song. It has a really cool melody. So the great thing about a discussion uh, about calling something the perfect guitar solo is uh, there's no perfect guitar solo. Better said, there are hundreds of perfect guitar solos. And it's great to hear people come up with what they think the perfect guitar solo is because there's so many of them. And yeah, Elliot is a lefty. I really researched this and I got a lot of it from an interview he did with Jimmy Vivino. And uh, it's on YouTube. It's called The Green Room with Jimmy Vivino. So check it out. And Elliot tells these stories really, really well. And as I said, he's kind of become the chronicler and the spokesman for the band. Now, the cool thing about the cars is I moved to L.A. at the end of 1979. And there were two giant trends at that time. There was New Wave and then there was basically Van Halen. <laughs> well, there's Christopher Cross, too. I mean, there was a lot of eclectic directions in music back then. So it just wasn't... The 80s w were a lot of things. I mean, you think about Peter Gabriel and some of the great stuff he did in the 80s. 
A lot of really musical stuff in the 80s, and this was more on the track of The Knack. Now, The Knack had My Sharona when I moved to L.A., and that was huge. But also, Van Halen's first record was huge, too. So there was a lot of really cool music in different genres that was really strong back then. Uh, and indeed, uh, I don't know if you guys saw Rick Beato's interview with Andy Summers, but he shows what the walking on the moon chord is. It's at D, D minor 11. Of course, it's a much cleaner sound. He also says it's just chorus and reverb. No delay on that. There's a lot of talk about what the best-selling gear of last year was, and I was really curious about the best-selling amps. Apparently, the top three amps, look, I have them here, are the Positive Grid Spark 40, the Boss Katana 50 Mark II, and the Yamaha THR30 Mark II. These are all solid-state sort of modeling amps, and I'd like to try one of them. I don't have one of them because people ask me, they want to know, can you recommend a, an affordable amplifier? And affordable can mean a lot of different things. I mean, the Tone Master Deluxe by Fender is also on the list of a best-selling amp, but I think it's around $1,000, maybe it's $800. That might not be affordable to you, but these amps, I think, are all in the $400 range, $300, $400 range. And that's really interesting to me. So I want to check out, particularly the Boss Katana, uh, I want to check that one out. Line 6 Spider, great, yeah, great uh, suggestion. But if you want an amp, the thing about the Tone Master uh, Deluxe is it looks right. You know, it looks like it looks like the Fender amp you always have seen for the last 40 or 50 years, so pretty, pretty, pretty cool. Anyway, um, yeah, this is the new Heritage. You know, oddly, I took it away. Uh, I took it to a music store uh, for a little event, Angel City, Drove a couple of miles, spent the afternoon, came back, and the neck had changed. So that's why, if you ever wonder why I don't have the truss rod cover, these guitars change so often. The neck, it was not easy to play anymore. And so I had to adjust and adjust and, and tweak the action, and then I got it back pretty well. Still wasn't perfect. I woke up the next morning, and it came back perfect. And it seems even more perfect now. It's almost like it went way out of whack. I readjusted it, and then over the last few days, it's gotten better just sitting here. So that's, that's why you always see these covers off. I even have the tool right in front of me. To, oh, here it is. It's right here. I, I am constantly adjusting the neck because I like my guitars to play perfectly. So, yeah, there you go. Oh, anyway, you're saying you have the THR30 and the Boss Katana. You love both, and they sound incredibly good. Very cool. Yeah, this solo, it's... It's always been one of my favorites, and I think somebody mentioned, once you start diving into these things and you see they're not easy to play, like you hear it and you go, oh, I could do that, and then you realize, oh, I, I can't do that so well. So I actually practiced this, you know, this is a typical thing for me to say, but I probably played this a hundred times before I got it up to where it needed to be, but I don't mind that. It's kind of, to me, it's kind of like a meditation. R repetition in music, when I study something, I almost... I almost uh, feel like it's a meditation and a, and a way to, uh, well, it just takes me a long time anyway, but I, I don't mind playing something 100, 200 times to learn it. It's just, you know, it feels good in a way. And then as a session musician, you go to work and you have no time. They, you got to do it instantly. So that's, that's like the, the opposite. It's like, give me something amazing now. And you go... First take, we're done. Boom. I love solos where you have to do just one tricky thing. Two tricky things and then I don't love it so much, but I love solos where there's one tricky thing that you have to do. It really, really makes me happy. Somebody asked about position shifts uh, and I have a simple answer for that. That's, you know, it's one of the biggest things I do when I solo and it's very simply put, I will either lead up the neck with my little finger or third finger and I'll lead down the neck with my index finger. Let me demonstrate. So if I'm here, I drop down, I'm in a new position. I drop down, I'm in a new position. I drop down, see I'm just dropping down. Same thing going up, might use my little finger. Uh, here I'm just leading up with the little finger. But the third finger is stronger, so often that's the one I lead up with. 
Let me demonstrate that. And then you get comments. The thing about the, if you don't use the little finger, you get comments occasionally from people like uh, they get really uh, ornery about the fact that you're only a three finger player. <laughs> but that's, that's just be, being on YouTube. It's like, you know, you're... so often I'll just make sure that I drop the little finger in <laughs> because I am quite, you know, most of my stuff gets done with three fingers. <laughs> Yeah, I have small hands, and so my whole focus these days is like, this is a 60s slim taper size neck. It's not the biggest net. I don't like the thinnest neck either, but I definitely like super low action. I use 9 through 42 most of the time, and there's a specific neck build that I like. Even the 24.75 uh, scale length is, is where I'm headed these days. I mean, I can pick up a fender and play it, but I'm just getting more and more... Uh, comfortable with admitting that I have small hands and I like guitars that are easier to play for this hand size. Some of the people we look at, um, you know, their hands are like this big, you know, it's, but that, that's not me. So I just do, I do what I can with my hands and I really try and pick guitars that are easy to play these days. I suggest the same for you guys too. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we did a Masterclass Members Only live stream um, on Thursday night. So somebody brought up today that it was 3 in the morning, <laughs> that live stream for uh, one of our friends in Europe. And uh, moving forward, you know, if you become a live stream member, I'm going to do the live stream Members Only uh, uh, for Masterclass live streams. I'm going to do one in the evening for people in the U.S. because that's a better time. People are off work. And then I'll do one during the day. And that... That's great for people in Europe and across the pond. So we're going to do more Masterclass Members Only live streams in 2024. And they're very casual. I mean, we we spend a full hour and we are really... There's a lot of inside baseball, a lot of stuff that um, that we, we talk about that's just happening in the industry. And and uh, they're awesome. So if you... Uh, and we archive them in the masterclass. If you take the 14-day free trial in the masterclass, you can you can see our masterclass uh, members only live streams, and, and you'll you'll see what that's all about. They're very 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 personal and uh, very slow. Okay, here we're going in again. Okay, let's let's see if we can not make a mistake. You know, it's funny. I end a lot of slow, uh, a lot of, I end a lot of solos low. I heard a solo on the radio the other day. It was the end, at the end of a Christmas song, and it ended low. And I used to do these Christmas records every year. They were called a very special Christmas. Like I did five of them in a row, and you do them in the summertime because that's how you get the work done for Christmas. And I was in a, 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 a store the other day, and I heard this solo that ended low on a Christmas song, and I went, "Oh, that was probably me." <laughs> Because these things still still get played. It, it was like you know, <laughs> I heard that and I was like, oh, I bet that's one of the ones I did. Because you can end high. I mean, uh, how about ending in the middle? Okay, I'm gonna end in the middle on this one more time. Okay, here we go. How about ending in the middle? Why not? End high, end low, and end in the middle. Somebody was asking, does em emulating your heroes stifle creativity? I think it is uh, essential when you're beginning to emulate your heroes. And then at a certain point, make sure that you hide that a little bit and that, or that you take influences from so many different players and combine them so much 
that then you don't sound exactly like them. Uh, and then later in life, once you've had your own style, it's just really nice to go back and emulate your heroes because you're in no danger. Like once you've played guitar for a couple of decades, you're in no danger of slipping back into sounding exactly like Eddie Van Halen or David Gilmour or whoever your hero is. Uh, I believe that. I mean, uh, but I think when you start, even in the first decade, definitely emulate people and sound like them for a while, but then start to develop a sense of responsibility about, well, maybe maybe I'm doing a Gilmore lick, but my tone is different, and the guitar is different, and maybe I end it differently than he would have. You know, there's certain signature bends that, like Jeff Beck uh, has always done and David Gilmore, and maybe at a certain point you want to stop doing those. Certain little things... It's actually good to, to stay away from when you're establishing your own style. How about one more playthrough? Here we go. How about the bass pickup? Tech pickup. Yeah, Elliot Easton played so many great solos, and he worked these things out, you know. It's, uh, I, like I said, I did tons of research. I did, I listened to many interviews with the man. And, you know, when they were doing a record, he would go back to his hotel room with his cassette player and play the track over and over and compose the solo. But in this particular situation, their first record, I think this stuff was just so worked out that when they showed up in London to record it, they just threw it down. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to play us out, and I'll see you guys on the next one. Okay, bye-bye.